uh, on uh, Sunday, we kind of ended with the so-called golden text of the Bible, John 3.16, and we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Martin Luther called John 3.16 the Bible in a miniature. We talked about that because it touches on the entire scope of God's plan. And in Roper's book, if you've got a chance to go through it, he went in great detail with what all the words mean. God, for God, the greatest being, so loved the greatest trait, the world, the greatest company, that he gave, which is the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift. That whoever, this is the greatest opportunity, believes, and we're going to talk about that later on today, the greatest foundation in him, the greatest attraction, shall not perish, the greatest tragedy. But, this is the greatest difference, have eternal life, the greatest promise. One of the things that I brought out is so many of our denominational and, and brethren and, and those who are somewhat familiar with the scripture believe that John 3.16 when it says that whoever believes, that's the only thing they got to do. I believe. But what kind of a belief are we talking about here? An active one, an obeying one, obedience. Yeah, yeah, well, we're going to get to that. And so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, when we speak with people that they have a, a clear understanding of what that means. See, God, God's love expects a response of faith. Okay? God wants everybody, every person, to believe in Him. The new birth that we've been talking about, that regeneration, requires faith. Remember we touched upon Hebrews uh, 11 and 6 that without faith it is what? Impossible. Impossible to please God. Without faith, being born of the water and the Spirit would be meaningless, if not impossible. Any thoughts or questions on the kind of review up to this point or where we just first started? Verses can't be that's, That's right. right. Mark? It's possible to be saved by mental faith only. Then Paul of Tarsus didn't need to arise and be baptized to wash away his sins. Because he already believed. You did? He met the Lord on him. That would get your attention. He even called him Lord. Uh, so I mean, if that's not belief or faith, I don't know what it would be. Uh, all those people in Acts, second chapter, the 3,000 that repented were baptized right to the church. There's no need for them to do that if they just had to believe. That's right. You know, I it's an obedient them. faith that. Yeah. And, and on and on and on. You know, makes us have a response. They, they demonstrated uh, not dead faith, which is a faith without works. Right. Uh, they obeyed the works that God put before them. And of course, we're blessed with that. Big there is. There is a big difference. Good. Okay. Um, let's look at verse 17. It reads, For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, some see a contradiction with this verse and over in chapter 9, verse 39, which says, for judgment, I came into this world. It is clear that Jesus has the authority to judge. We find this over in uh, chapter 5, if you want to turn over just a couple of chapters. Starting in verse 26. It says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the son of man. Now some of your translations in mine, I, I read it with the word judgment or judge. 
Some of them may say condemn the world. But that is not the point in the passage under consideration. The word rendered judge in the passage means to condemn. And if we reread that and assert condemn instead of a judge, we would see that altogether it's unfortunate that some will be condemned. When judgment comes, there will be some condemned. This was not the purpose of Jesus coming into the world. Remember in Luke 19.10, Jesus came to what? Seek and save the lost. And it's only through Him that the world can be saved. Thoughts or questions? Yes, Mark. Mark. Verse 18, if you would. It says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. He has already been condemned. He doesn't have to wait for the final judgment to stand in condemnation. He's already condemned. See, by rejecting God's gift of his one and only Son, the unbeliever discards the only hope he has. Pretty sure our distinction is drawn between those who believe and those who don't believe. Can you see that big difference? Question in the back, or you okay? Oh, okay. I thought you raised your hand. I'm sorry. Um, we find in verses 19, 20, and 21 the reason that unbelievers stand condemned. John's words of Jesus are both negative, we see that in verses 19 and 20, and affirmative in 21. 19 says, And this condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And in 21 it says, But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. We see here that the positive, the light came into the world. The light came in to enlighten every man. Jesus said in chapter 8 verse 12 that he in fact is the light. However, in spite of his coming into the world to enlighten every man, many, many rejected him. We've seen that. Verse 19 tells us why. Too many people are immersed in their wicked ways and have no intention of changing. They are content to remain in darkness. They enjoy the pressure that, or the pleasure rather, that is found in sin. You know, it's interesting. Hebrews 11.25 calls it the passing or the temporary pleasures of sin. Meaning that it's not going to last. It's not going to last. It's interesting when you think about it. Wicked people are night operators. Think about that. Let that sit in. Ben, when are most crimes committed? Yeah, a lot of them are at night. A lot of them. Are, when are you the busiest? Busy at night, yeah. I mean, they hope that the darkness hides their evil deed. They don't want to get caught. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that graveyard shift. You got to love it. <laughs> so much going on. We see in verse 20 that others reject the light. The world hates the light because the light exposes those deeds of the world, those evil deeds. And then in verse 21, as we ended up, we see the contrast. Again, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. 
He doesn't come to the light so that he can show off and boast about his deeds. No. But his deeds are known by God and by others many times. Any thoughts, comments? Yes, Mark. Uh huh. The part of the verse that says, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Right. If you can pick up those words with uh, Mark uh, chapter 16, where Jesus mm -hmm. is facing his disciples about the world, it says there, but he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Initially. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. Notice he doesn't say. It doesn't say that he is a believer not and is baptized or not. It yeah. doesn't have to. Yeah. You know, if, he, if he doesn't believe, he's not going to be baptized. Why does he obey the Lord's baptism if he doesn't even believe in the Lord's exactly. baptism? That's what he said. No. I can't personally put it in my life tell me what I see. That's because it doesn't say baptized by it. Uh, it just means faith only. It no. And we, and we know that. That would completely contradict what you just read here. Exactly. Good point. Other comments? Okay, verses 22 through the rest of the chapter discuss the first ministry in Judea and further testimony of John. Look at verse um, 22, please. It says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. and There he remained with them and baptized. When he says after these things, what does that mean? What things is John writing about? It really refers to an indefinite period of time. After these things, those things that had gone on previously, whatever time that may be. In other words, sometime after Jesus' attendance at the Passover and his encounter with Nicodemus, he and his disciples, probably still the six, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Nathaniel, went into the land of Judea. It's interesting that they had been in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. So if they were already there, why does it say they came into the land of Judea? It's a little misleading, but a better way to understand it is what Roper actually put in, and I've seen this in other commentaries, it's best to understand it that this passage is using the NIV translation, which reads the Judean countryside. Again, and that's which, what, what Roper said. In other words, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the Judean countryside, and there he remained with them and baptized. Baptized. So they were in the Judean countryside to preach and teach. The estimated time of them being there was about three to eight months. And we are given a couple of pieces of information concerning this period. First, Christ was spending time with his disciples. He was teaching them and allowing them, which I think is very important, to get to know him. Remember, he, they hadn't been around him that long. Second, he was baptizing as his forerunner, John the Baptist, had been and was doing. Now, this baptism was apparently a continuation of John's baptism. And we remember that was a baptism of repentance. That's right, repentance. Jesus' ministry in Judea was evidently successful because John's disciples complained about it. Look in verse 26. It says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Now, that's a little bit of exaggeration, a little bit of uh, misleading there. We'll, we'll see here in the next chapter, it says Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Uh, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. Now we see from verse 23, going back up, that John was still baptizing in the area of Enon, Adon, near Salem, because there was much water, it says. What does much water 
lead you to conclude about baptism. You know, yeah, if it was just sprinkling, then we don't need much water, do we? We need lots of water. You know, consistent with the meaning of the word baptize, translated, translated baptizo, which is defined in any Greek dictionary. Yeah, as immersion, submerse, plunge, or to dip. No place do you see sprinkling in there. No place. Yeah. You know, if, that, if I knew the answer to that question, yeah, um, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It is. Everybody, yeah, that's right. Opinions. It's interesting to know that Jesus' success was welcomed by John the Baptist, but not by his disciples who had remained with him. They were, to put it bluntly, jealous. Yeah, jealousy is a constant threat to the harmony of the work of the Lord. Now, verse 24, John, the author, for some reason, seemed it was important to write that for John, the Baptist, had not been thrown into prison. We'll see about this in a little bit. We see in verse 25, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples. And this discussion was about purification. King James Version says a dispute arose between some of John the Baptist's disciples and the Jews, being plural. And it's interesting, the New American Standard Bible in the ESV says a Jew, singular. And when you look at uh, the manuscripts by the scholars, the evidence is mixed as to whether it was one Jew or more than one. But it's interesting that I guess most scholars think it was, they lean towards being one Jew. One Jew. And this discussion centered around the Jewish ritual itself, namely dipping people and objects in water to achieve ceremonial cleanness. And it's interesting, when John the Baptist's disciples came to him after this uh, dispute, they didn't even mention him. They didn't even mention him. Um, look at verse 26. And again, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to him you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all is coming to him. There's nothing about the dispute on the purification. Nothing at all. These complaints from John's disciples prompted him, prompted him to testify again concerning who Jesus was. While John knew his role well, he did. It seems clear that some of his disciples did not fully understand, even though they had heard John's words back in chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. It was a contest for him, which I don't understand. You know, it was a contest, I guess, on who could baptize the most. doesn't make sense. Now, this is the setting for the last words ever uttered by John the Baptist in this gospel account, 27 through 36. And we're going to look at that. John began his reply by noting a basic principle. Each person has a particular gift or role from God, and it's the person's responsibility to fulfill that role. His work had been authorized by heaven, by God. John was exercising his role God intended him to do, to bear witness of Jesus. Look at verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness, I said. I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Christ was sent to announce his, Jesus' is coming and to prepare the way for him. Instead of resenting that, the popularity of Jesus, John rejoiced in it. Look at verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. It seems like in Jewish customs, 
There was a guy, I mean, today we might call him the best man. But there was a friend of the bridegroom. And he was responsible for taking care of a lot of things. In fact, he was to give the wife to be away. And when he heard the voice of the uh, groom accept his wife to be, that made him happy. A big sigh of relief was given, if you will. And so that's why it says that he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. The bridegroom is accepting his bride to be. And that's important. That's important. Instead of resenting the popularity of Jesus, John rejoiced in it. John was the epitome, we talked about this a couple of lessons ago, the epitome of humility. Epitome of humility. With joy, John said in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. What does that mean? Okay, I must humble myself, get out of the way. Other thoughts? So, something more important? Yeah. It means all those things, but it also implies that it is time for me to step away and let others take my place. You know, <laughs> what comes to mind when I hear that is people who play sports and they keep wanting to play that one last year, that one last year. I mean, uh, you, uh, you know who I'm going to say? The guy that's on my mind right now is about Tom Brady. You know, he retired, but now he's coming back. And I'm not saying that's bad, but there is a time to step away and let it go. <laughs> yes, our ego is getting away big time, huge. You know, you want to go out on top? Well, he came pretty close to winning two Super Bowls in a row. That's, that's coming out on top in my book. But it's time to let go. The Lee's last word to John the Baptist to be recorded in this gospel form surely one of the greatest utterances that ever fell from human lips. As Roper said, and this is, this is good, hard feelings would be avoided if each of us could say gracefully, without animosity, that he or she must increase, but I must decrease. Isn't that true? Any thoughts, comments? It does. Mark. Speakers, um, years, and years. Don't take the school. I think they need me. <laughs> because when they got the school, it's going to see all guard. No. The unknown. It's sometimes hard to transition to retirement. I mean, yes, Doug? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one is indispensable. They're all replacements.
Sometimes you reach a point where your voice just can't do it anymore. We get old. No mice, no mice like that. Okay. Could, could you kind of groom somebody else to be a Bible class teacher, a song leader, and to help with leading prayers, maybe a sermon once in a while? Um, it's, it's important because we, those of us who have done that for years aren't going to, we're not going to do that forever. No. And that's why it's so important, I think, to have the young people that we do. And we can teach them and bring them up. I mean, that that that's the future of the church, folks. You know, these these congregations, unfortunately, they don't have any young people in them. They're eventually going to die out. And, and it's sad, but it happens. That's right. Or or they don't have any. I mean, that's yeah. Originally, yeah. Notice in verse thirty. Uh, 1 through 36, John is telling us why Jesus must increase and, and he must decrease. Uh, 31 itself says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Emphasis on above all. Above all. Yeah, well, he thought, you know, it's good, better, or better. Yeah, yeah. Notice in verse 32, And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Now, that's a little bit misleading, okay? There were some who believed. To what degree, we don't know. Um, Nicodemus certainly had some inclination something was going on but he couldn't make that leap, if you will. Jesus bore witness to the truth. He testified to what he has seen and heard. And since Jesus was from above, he was in a position to know what he was talking about. After all, he was deity himself. The last part of 32 is, again, a little bit misleading. Let me read it again. Uh, and no one receives his testimony. And then you jump down to the beginning of verse 33, it contradicts itself and says, he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Don't, don't, don't read into it as a contradiction because it's kind of true on both parts. There were some who received it and some who didn't. So it's not all or nothing as, as kind of what it may read to you. It's part of both. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, verse 34. Key verse. Let me read it to you. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. Think about it for a moment. In the past, God has sent many messengers, hasn't he? Okay. Prophets. To convey his divine message. Each one of these prophets had received the Spirit according to the purpose God had for these messengers. In other words, it was limited. It was limited. This is not the case with Jesus. Because God gave the Spirit, what does it say? Without measure. It means there was no limit. No limit to what Jesus had the ability to speak about and had the authority to do, especially in those things of heavenly places. He was able to speak the words of God because that's where he came from. Interesting. Thoughts come. Okay, look at verse 35, please. It says, The Father's love, the Father loves the Son and has given all all things into his hand. Verse 35, John says that Jesus was greater and should be listened to because he had been authorized by who? The Father and had been given all things to him in his hand. All things. And then verse 36 serves as the climax, if you will, of the chapter. Summarizing what has been said about the new birth. If we read, he who believes, 
What does that mean? What kind of belief is it? We've talked about it. An obedient belief. Uh, a belief in this passage refers to a faith that acts, does something. It's a faith that obeys. And, of course, we've quoted before and here in the last couple of times uh, what uh, James 2.22 uh, 2 says, that a faith without works is, is dead. Is dead. As the chapter ends, we see an affirmative or a positive statement followed by a negative one. Yes. Yes. Sure, please do. Uh, it's a, it, it, uh, the interpretation. Okay. It seems to me that the Father in this particular verse has more power than anyone else because he's been giving power. You understand what I'm saying? What is, specifically, which verse are you looking at? 35? The way I kind of remember it is that God gave all authority to Jesus. All authority on earth. While he was on earth. All power and authority. He gives the power. It sounds like he has the power. Well, he, yeah, he, he, he does have the power. And he gives it without measure, without limit, to his son. Then the son and the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm driving at. I, uh, they're equal. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. It's a little bit contradictory. I don't think it is. Yeah. But it sounds a little bit kind of I honestly don't see it that way, but we can talk more. And it's good, good discussion item. Yeah. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he himself declares that. Mm -hmm. There's no limit to my power. Right. Anyways, heaven, here on earth, anyways. He's been given all the He's been given by God. By God. So, yes. God had it first. Yes. That's the way I would understand. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. I want to close with a couple thoughts about Nicodemus. I kind of feel sorry for Nicodemus. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we don't know what happened after verse 12 between Nicodemus and Jesus because the Bible, well, it, it's silent on the matter. We do not know that Nicodemus tried, but we do know that Nicodemus tried to defend Jesus when the Jews arrested him. Remember that? In John chapter 7, we'll get to that in a few weeks, verses 50-51. And he also contributed to Jesus having a proper burial. We see that later on in John 2, chapter 19, verse 39. So what Jesus did and said, obviously, had a big effect on Nicodemus. But didn't did Nicodemus ever go from believing that Jesus was sent from God, which states that in chapter 3, verse 2, to believing that he was the actual Messiah? We don't know. The scripture is silent on that. Nicodemus is never mentioned after Jesus' burial, including not being mentioned among the disciples in Acts at all. Thus, we do not know if Nicodemus truly came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah or if he remained in his conviction that Jesus was just a prophet sent by God. He missed out. Missed out. Any comments or questions before we go to the questions? Okay. Turn over if you have your papers. I'm looking at the individual study guide because that has more questions and uh, it covers all the ones on the other study guide for lesson 15. First question is who was Nicodemus? Well, I don't know if he was the high priest. He was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews, teacher of the Jews. Remember, that's what they called him. He was a member of what? The Sanhedrin. Uh, of what Jewish sect was Nicodemus a member? Pharisees. 
Okay? Um, what was the Sanhedrin? How would you describe it? Jewish high court, like the Jewish Supreme Court. Exactly right. It comes from a Greek word that means assembly or council. It is made up of 70 members along with the high priest. That goes all the way back to Numbers chapter 11, verse 16. It's very interesting. Um, what was the significance of Nicodemus's, Nicodemus going to see Jesus at night? Didn't want to be seen. We, we talked about that possibility. Maybe it was the only time possible that he had free. As, as a rabbi, they would study late in the evening hours. And maybe this was the only time he had. Mark? Wanted to talk to him alone. Maybe this. That's right. He attracted a crowd. Um, and, and like we talked about, maybe he was nervous a little bit and didn't want people to be know that he had been seen with Jesus. There's the, the scriptures don't specifically say, but we can let kind of our imagination roll a little bit with it. Um, what was Nicodemus's misconception of the kingdom? A physical, an earthly kingdom, right? Oh, a big power, uh, you know, grab a uh, human armies is going to defeat. Um, yes. Yeah. We're we're hard on them. Yeah. And change is hard. You know, I mean, let's be all minute first. Change is hard. And so for Nicodemus, this is what he knew. This is what he grew up believing. Um, and, and Jesus tried to teach him some of the old scriptures of the Old Testament. But, but he didn't quite. Some are, yes, I believe that's true. They, they think that that's Jesus coming back to establish an earthly kingdom. Yeah, they wanted to be the chosen people. Exactly. I saw a hand, maybe. Uh, maybe not. Okay. Um, what is the meaning of the Greek word "amen"? So be it. This is so. Uh, another way, remember, the saying is what I'm about to tell you is very true. Very true. You need to listen. When and how is a person born again? That's right. Believes, repent, and is baptized. Okay. We remember that this born again was not used after Pentecost. It was the repent, uh, believes, repent, confess, and be baptized. Okay. So that's interesting. What is the nature of Jesus' kingdom? It's a heavenly kingdom. Entered by how? A spiritual rebirth. I think that's an excellent term to use. I like it. What is the Greek word for wind and spirit? Remember, it's that word pneuma, where we get our word for the air machines that are powered by air tools, uh, pneumatic. What is often, what passage is often called the golden text of the Bible? We talked about it. John 3.16. See it everywhere. Billboards, carved bumper stickers. What is the kind of faith that saves? Obedient faith. Got to have it. Obedient faith. What is the greatest trait in the world? Love. Exactly. 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. I want to turn there because it's good. It should be, yeah. Well, I did write it down here, Doug, on it. And now, abide, uh, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love. Describe uh, belief as the greatest foundation. It refers to Hebrews 11, 16. Belief as the greatest foundation. Without it, 
it is impossible to please God. I think that's where it's going. That's what I wrote anyway. And the last one, what prompted Jesus to leave Judea and go back to Galilee? A little bit of an introduction into our next uh, chapter 4. John was arrested, okay? And uh, I'm not going to go into any great detail. I brought my notes for the next lesson just in case we did get to it. But um, a couple things I want you to think about before uh, next uh, Sunday. Um, It says in uh, verse 1, uh, let's see. He left, uh, verse 3, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Verse 4, here's what I want. But he needed to go through Samaria. Some translations say he had to go through Samaria. He passed through, okay? Between now and then, don't blurt out the answers. Think about why, was that the only way to go? No, we're going to, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And so anyway, think about that. And then the other thing I want you to think about, and this is good, uh, let me find it. What I'm looking for right here, verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. Okay? Your task is to find out how she knew he was a Jew. Okay? Have some fun with it. All right, thanks, everybody. It was a great class.